Um, all right, y'all, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we actually, we have a number of conveners. Um, I think, in fact, everybody that's leading something this fall is here um, to share what they'll be doing, what their class will be doing. So if everyone takes five minutes, then we'll be at about 45 minutes and then hopefully have some time at the end for questions. Um, but I am gonna go ahead and get started just so we have um, uh, enough time to get through everything. Uh, this is obviously our virtual adult ministry fair. So typically this would take place either in the TK Young Room or as of last year in Montgomery Hall. So just imagine with me, if you would, that you're taking a walk through Montgomery Hall as we, uh, as we hear about what uh, all of these fall classes are doing. Um, I'm gonna go, I think, roughly in the order of the week, so starting with Sunday morning uh, classes. Um, and then ending with ones that really can be accessed um, at any time. And, uh, sorry, I'm looking at a, a chat here. Okay, I think we're gonna try to mute somebody. Just as a, a housekeeping thing, y'all, unless you are speaking, please do put yourself on mute, um, which you can find for most of you, it's gonna be in the lower left hand corner and it kind of looks like a microphone and you click on it and it mutes you. Just went away, there it is. Okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and open us in prayer. Will you pray with me? Oh God, I thank you for the gift of this new day and for waking us to it. I thank you for the gift of all who are gathered here and for those who will be uh, leading us in our time together this morning. I pray uh, that this time would whet our appetites for all of the ways that we can be formed in this season that is upon us, that we might be the disciples that you call and need us to be for the living of these days. I ask all these things in Christ Jesus name. Amen. All right. Uh, is Rick Baker with us? Do I see Rick yet? Rick, if you're there, can you take yourself off mute? Oh, I see you. You with us, Rick? Okay, Rick, I think we're gonna go ahead and start with you in Faith and Function because that's a Sunday morning class. Um, and from there we'll go to, um, well, I'll share a little bit uh, about the anti-racism study after that. Um, so I'm on deck, <laughs> but Rick, why don't you go ahead and, and get us started? Is anybody else having, Rick is frozen to me. Is he frozen to others? Yes, this is yes. Betsy, he's frozen to me. Okay, so I can see him in the little gallery. Oh. His face is moving, but yeah, in the screen it wasn't, but it's now, and Rick, you're muted, so. Or possibly if you're sharing your screen, you're not sharing audio. This is I think technical difficulties occur even when we're not online, so this is no surprise. <laughs> Rick, right now you're still frozen oh. in my screen. Yeah. What? Okay. Well, do you? What do you see? I see a slide on the left that says "Faith and Function and Ancient Test for Today's Questions." On the right, there's an inset with a picture of you that is not the same as the picture of you in the gallery. Uh, and it moved a little bit earlier, but it's mostly not moving. Okay, it's you do at the intro. It's moving again. Oh, but we can't hear it. 
I can't hear it. Can y'all hear it? Okay. No. Um, <clears throat> this is what it says. <laughs> um, unfortunately, recently we have used the term biblical proportions quite a bit in describing what we are experiencing with pandemic and high winds and even locusts in East Africa. But as Christians, we also know that biblical proportions we have in hope and joy. And in the faith and function class, we explore both of these things um, in, in our journey of faith. And we have scholars who are um, who help us on this journey. Um, and we hope that people are going to be able to join us either in person or in virtually. Yeah. And this morning, um, we'll, we're going to have two of my fellow facilitators, Daniel Edwards and Judy Hall, um, uh, introduce our leaders for uh, this semester. Harper. 
trouble. You're going to get in trouble. Go get a toy. Many of the main ideas employed by Jesus. 
Jesus and the New Testament writers from Persia to Christian women. The series was originally scheduled for this past March. I'm sure it will be worth the wait. My class for Faith and Function this fall is entitled Images of Discipleship in the New Testament. And I've chosen that title, uh, Images, because there are varying ways in which not only Jesus, but Paul and St. Peter and even John describe what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And sometimes they even seem a bit contradictory. And I want us to examine these different images to understand exactly how we are to follow Jesus and why even seemingly contradictory images might be used. Just as an example, the simplest image is that of Jesus himself who says, follow me. But you get into someone like Paul, and he says one of the major aspects of being a follower of Jesus or to be a Christian is to put to death in oneself various things. Well, that doesn't sound overly lively now, does it? And yet, in a remarkable way, it is. So we're going to look at a number of different images Sometimes one, sometimes more than one in, in uh, each session uh, that I'm going to have with you this fall. I hope you'll find it both interesting and encouraging. Well, thank you. I apologize for running over, over time, but uh, my ed editing skills are very very poor. So thank you. Thank you, Rick. I'm going to, that was, um, I, I'm, I'm excited about this. You have a lot of really good stuff lined up. Um, I'm going to ask you all to hold your questions until the very end um, uh, of the hour when we can ask questions of any of the conveners. We might actually put this slide <laughs> back up, um, but we are going to move on. Um, to the other class that's going to be offered on Sunday uh, mornings this fall, and that is our anti-racism study. So we're calling it Looking Inward, Moving Forward, an Anti-Racism Journey. It is a study that has been put together by Mary McIntosh and Charles Key and Cliff Johnson and Elizabeth Doolin and myself. And it's a class that's going to take place both on Sunday mornings and on um, Wednesday evenings as our Word on Wednesday offering. Um, we're offering it twice a week in the hope that it will increase in participation. So for those of you that, um, you know, we just got that, that incredible presentation on the faith and function class. If you say, man, I really wanna do both of these things, um, you can do that. You can be part of uh, the faith and function class on Sunday mornings and then on Wednesday evenings, uh, you can come and be part of the, the anti-racism class. The Wednesday material is simply going to repeat what was done um, on Sunday, okay? Um, so the need for this study became clear earlier this summer really before then, but, um, but certainly earlier this summer when uh, the killings of unarmed black people um, at the hands of public safety officers and vigilantes uh, threw our country into not only collective grief, but into collective action. We've seen this kind of pulsing in our cities in the last months. Um, when we gathered for our first Word on Wednesday gathering earlier this summer, I think it was just days after Breonna Taylor's death, um, we talked about how this conversation is often stopped before it even begins because it, um, it, it sort of pits people of color and their allies against um, police officers, many of whom we, you know, we know and love. Um, 
So this team that has been working on this um, is sort of starting with the standpoint that the implicit biasy that um, can manifest in deadly ways when a black person is killed by a police officer, those same implicit biases uh, live in us too. And what we share with everyone involved is the burden of, um, of racism. What we share is the burden of being um, products of a society with both a past and a present that, um, that devalues people of color. So our team sees that devaluation and how we um, organize and fund our schools and how we dole out justice and how we provide healthcare. And we see how that devaluation shapes us um, as individuals, as people who carry feelings of either superiority or inferiority, of fear, um, a whole lot of things that are just easier to not really look at. So this is a study, it's a journey really, that starts with um, the assumption that racism is not just a problem out there, right? It's something um, that if we're ever really gonna get a handle on it, we have to start by looking um, inside ourselves. So this is a, it is a study that is a, um, we, we keep saying it's a conversation between the head and the heart. Um, every session is gonna start with uh, Lectio Divina, it's gonna start with scripture, it's gonna start with an openness and a, a humility before God. Um, and ultimately, you know, it's not about just consuming more information about racism. It's about, um, it's about being formed as disciples of, of Jesus Christ um, and figuring out what that, what that looks like in terms of how we're called to respond as Christians in this, um, in this season. So um, there's more that I could say there. Um, but I'm also cognizant that we have a lot more people <laughs> that we need to get to uh, in this fair today. So I think I'll stop there. And then if you have questions, uh, hold on to them, just hold them gently and you can, um, hopefully we'll have time to get to those uh, at the end. But I'm gonna move on right now to uh, Kirk Bobo. I can't see you on my screen, but I'm gonna invite you to speak. If you could unmute yourself. And you're going to tell us about the Tuesday um, Bible study. All right. Thank you, Sarah. I will uh, do my little uh, timer here. So maybe I'll do be on time. Uh, I am not the convener or leader uh, of this. I just am simply a participant. Um, but uh, Ted Mueller, who is the convener and one of the leaders, and Jim McClanahan uh, are, uh, were not available. So they asked me if I would take over. Uh, I was gonna tell you about some great door prizes and things that we give out, but I see Charles Keyes is on the call and he's a member of our class. So I, I have to uh, refrain from uh, talking about that. Uh, we meet on Tuesday mornings. Uh, it's been going on for about three years. Um, uh, there was not a men's Bible study, I think active at that time. And the uh, the, the uh, organizers wanted to do something uh, that was a relaxed environment uh, and primarily oriented towards those uh, who did not need to have a 6 a.m. Uh, gathering, or another way to say it, those that would rather have something a little bit later in the morning. Uh, that included breakfast, fellowship, prayer, and discussion and lasted for about an hour. Uh, as I said, uh, Ted and Jim uh, are our leaders. They are both uh, ministers, uh, which has been uh, extremely helpful in terms of the commentary and insights that they've been able to offer. However, uh, it's far from a lecture uh, uh, structure. I mean, there's, there's a widespread discussion, widespread participation. Uh, all the members of the class uh, are invited to read selected scriptures. 
Uh, we have a study guide. The ones we've been using were, uh, I think I have one here, the uh, uh, NT Write. This is my version, Rick, of a high-tech uh, visuals. And um, th uh, thus far, the, uh, this, the uh, study material has been uh, from the uh, Gospels. Uh, but the class uh, is, uh, every time we finish one, it's up to the class to decide uh, what we need or what we would like to move forward with. Uh, I think that if you talk to the uh, participants in the class, they would tell you that they uh, learn as much uh, from the uh, perspectives that are offered by the members of the class as they do from the study guides. Uh, we do not have a scheduled pace, so this isn't like on Tuesday, October the 5th, we're going to go from here to here and then in all of that. If, it, if we stick with uh, six verses for three meetings, so be it. Uh, I think that obviously slows us down a little bit, but I think it, uh, if we want to stop and talk about something that's significant uh, at any given time, uh, we're free to do that. Um, the, uh, the group or the organizers felt that it was important that this uh, be held at the church. Obviously, we have not been doing that uh, over the last several months since the pandemic, but the idea was that we wanted to uh, meet at Idlewild uh, and also that we did not want to limit the meeting purely to uh, Idlewild members uh, of our uh, 12 or so regular participants in 25 or so total uh, people that are uh, on our uh, mailing list, some of whom uh, attend on occasion. There are several that are not members of the church. So we think that's been, um, been an important uh, part of what, uh, of what we're doing. Uh, we chose 9 a.m. Uh, because we didn't want the uh, kitchen staff to have to make a, a special early morning arrival to prepare breakfast and um, that's worked out real well, and it's given the staff at the church an opportunity to grab a piece of bacon as they walk by uh, in the hall that's left over. Um, as I said, uh, so far, our work has been uh, the Gospels, Mark and Luke and the Book of Acts. And um, I guess uh, that's pretty much it. I think most of the participants uh, have comfortably migrated to the Zoom format. We do have a couple. Uh, that uh, have dropped out or, or suspended their participation um, because of just, I guess, not feeling comfortable trying it out. So uh, that's pretty much uh, an overview of the men's Bible study. Thank you, Kirk. Um, Mary Edith, I'm going to go to you next. I don't see you on my screen. But if you could unmute yourself. I'm here. There you are. Yes. Um, this is the Thursday morning Bible study, which has been going on at the church for about three years now. We do one several week session in the fall and another in the spring. This, the topic for this fall is the prophets speak today. We don't read the prophets very often. They lived, of course, centuries before Christ, but their words are surprising, surprisingly relevant to today, especially in a time of pandemic, racial unrest, and worsening poverty. We suffer many of the same ills as ancient Israel. When I started preparing this, I began by reading the prophet Isaiah, and here's what I came across in chapter 3. What do you mean by crushing my people, by grinding the face of the poor, says the Lord God? I read that and all I could do was see George Floyd's face grind into the dirt. And I thought, yes, they are talking to us today that the, we have the same issues that they had. Human nature just doesn't seem to change much. We'll be looking at the major prophets Isaiah of Jerusalem, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and 2nd Isaiah. They helped their people through crises, which, believe it or not, were even worse than ours. Their words bring challenge and comfort. It's not always a comfortable thing to study, 
but I think it really does have a lot to say to us today. Uh, we meet at 10 o'clock on Thursdays. We will begin uh, September 24th and go through the month of October. We will be Zooming. Um, as I said, we welcome both men and women, and we've had several people from Germantown Press join us too. So come and bring your friends. I say Barbara Powell. <laughs> She, she's a very faithful member of the group. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll be glad to answer questions later. Thank you, Mary Edith. Uh, Joyce Weber, I'm going to throw it to you next to tell us about Book Club. You um, put in a word for the Idlewild Book Club, and Bruce is going to do the technical work here. Uh, I just, the, the Idlewild Book Club meets every fourth Thursday of the month at 2 p.m. We, we usually met in the parlor. Of course, we can't do that anymore, but thanks to the church and uh, especially Jenny Moore, we've been able to continue using Zoom. Jenny Brooke. Uh, sorry, Jenny Brooke comes. Um, it is a little different, but we're getting pretty good at it, and we're so grateful to be able to use this. The book club was started by Tandy Gilliland in 2005. To begin with, it was mostly church members with one or maybe two of Tandy's friends who had connections with St. Jude. Now we have nine people with connections with St. Jude, three of uh, whom are church members. Um, I would say we have approximately 12 to 15 participating in our Zoom meetings. After Tandy left to go to uh, family in Kentucky, Terry Nelson uh, was our organizer. And she, uh, thanks to her, we have a complete archives back to 2005. Unfortunately, uh, Terry uh, passed away last year. We each take turns in selecting a book. Um, and just to give you some idea of what we've been reading, um, the, this one, The Screening Room by Alan Lightman was a lot of fun. You know, of course, that Alan Lightman is a professor of humanities and sciences. He um, is uh, part of the uh, the, the Lightman family of um, Malco Theatre's uh, business. And in this book, he tells stories of, about his family. He does put in the odd uh, fictional character. Um, we had a lot of fun with that. Soft in the Hedge was a, a delightful book about um, an illiterate 45-year-old man who, because of neglect while he was growing up, but things changed when he had a, a chance encounter with an elderly uh, woman who gave him his self-respect and introduced him to books. Uh, Louise Penny is a well-known popular um, Canadian mystery writer. Um, this uh, single thread was um, of the same author as uh, The Girl with the Pearl Earring. And in this one, the art was embroidery kneeling cushions for um, Winchester Cathedral, and it's set in 1932. And then uh, I'll, I'll jump to this. The Lost City of the Monkey Goat was a fantastic read. Um, it is, uh, it, it, it's a fascinating account of a group of scientists on an expedition in 2015 to look for a lost city in a rainforest region of Honduras, an area who had, uh, had, that had uh, no inhabitants, no human inhabitants for over 500 years. And it goes into describing uh, uh, diseases that probably was the cause of the, the culture here, the people just suddenly leaving. Um, and I'll go on to uh, Ordinary Grace was uh, a wonderful story. 
uh, of a 13 year old boy when uh, that year of his life he felt his whole world was falling apart his father was the local Methodist minister who was a fine man and whose life was centered around God's grace. And the outside boy, that we learned about the, the uh, pabbies or the, the travelers, the Irish travelers. And uh, that, that in itself was very interesting. They're a, 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 a minor ethnic Irish group and different from the Romanian uh, gypsies. And, uh, and now what we're reading this month is The Shadow of the Wind. This is uh, by uh, uh, the author uh, is, uh, the last name is that, and Carlos Ruiz Zafin, um, who died in June this year at the age of 55. He was born in Barcelona, and the, uh, the novel is set in Barcelona. And um, it's been regarded as the second most successful Spanish novel after Don Quixote. And it's two main stories that become interconnected. So everybody, anybody who wants to come is most welcome. If, uh, it'll be on August the 27th at 2 p.m. And if you can contact me, I'll be happy to give you the, the link to the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Um, do we have Ernst Kelly with us? Dr. Kelly? You're on mute, Ernest. There we go. Okay. 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 There we are. Yeah. Pat and I are here to present one of the longest running and least known parts of, of Adelweil's culture. Uh, and those of you who are studying the Bible might want to join us at 4 p.m. on Thursday afternoons. We're flexible because we're so few and we would work with you. But we meet by Zoom and we are uh, reading, we have been reading since 2008, uh, the New Testament in Greek, along with some ventures into the Septuagint and uh, some of the church fathers. Uh, I, I think there probably are a number of people here who know Greek maybe better than we do. Uh, we started with Milton Brown, who was a wonderful Christian and scholar in the Rhodes Religion Department. Uh, Milton passed away a few days ago, so years ago, years ago. So the rest of us are, are keeping on. Um, we are, we will work with you if you have a little Greek and want to refresh it. If you don't have Greek and want to learn it, we will get with you on the side and, and get you some easy ways into the Greek New Testament and have you reading it in a shorter time than you would imagine. Uh, it's, um, I, I won't go into why this is such a good study, but I can tell you that if you read the original, you will come away with an, un, an appreciation of the Bible and understanding of some of the complexities that you just cannot get in translation, and it will be a, a changing experience for you. So anybody who wants to do that can contact us. Uh, Brenda has our, our number, 568-8462 uh, is my number and we will work with you and talk with you about what you want and what material you need and see you into it. Some, some of you I know, I recognize a couple of our lost and stolen and strayed sheep from years gone by who are welcome to come back and resume their studies. But we would love to have you. We will work with you. And I think you'll find for reasons that I don't have time to go into that it's really a uh, a remarkable experience to, to read the the New Testament as close as we can get to the original words of Jesus and and it's a, a marvelous experience. So call us if you want us and we'll work with you. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Um, Jenna Sykes, I'm going to throw it to you to tell us about Christian parenting. All right. Um, well, we are Christian parenting for young children, so traditionally it's been parents of younger children, though our programming this fall 
is really going to be appropriate for parents of children and teenagers, just any age of children. Um, so we will be meeting the third Thursday of every month. Hopefully that's easy to remember. Um, we're going to be meeting at 8 p.m. So hopefully after we can get the little ones to bed and be able to focus. <laughs> but um, our class is kind of notorious for late arrivals and having to step out when we need to just due to the nature of being a parent. Uh, so this fall, um, the first class is going to be focusing on healthy technology use. This can be led by Christy Nobman from CAFE. Uh, I feel like this is a really um, timely uh, class because of the pandemic and uh, the changes that has caused with um, not being able to take our children places. And so there's a lot more technology use. A lot of children are going to be doing virtual school this fall. So there's, I feel like there's a lot of questions of how to do this in a healthy way. Um, and let's see, the next class, this past spring, we did a book study on Parenting Forward, um, How to Raise Children with Justice, Mercy, and Kindness by Cindy Wayne Brandt. And it brought up a lot of interesting topics, but it really just barely scratched the surface. And we wanted to kind of dig deeper on some of those topics. So this fall, uh, some of our classes are going to be digging deeper. And so the September study is going to be um, parenting for inclusion, where it's we're going to hear from members of Idlewild's Gay Straight Fellowship sharing their own experiences, whether that's um, a member of the LGBTQ community, uh, how they their experiences as a child or as now raising children and then parents of LGBTQ children um, talking about their experiencing experiences. Um, then in October, our study will be led by Sarah Doreen Christians. Um, this was basically from this book study, it brought up the idea of Jesus as a feminist and so we wanted to dig deeper into that idea and so <clears throat> Sarah's going to be talking about touching on that but it's it's going to be a broader conversation of about how language shapes and shifts our images of God and the importance of <clears throat> a diversity of language or images when it comes to talking about God especially with our children um, then in November, uh, Ann Apple is going to be talking about um, at-home Advent practices. And finally, in December, I'm very excited about this one. This is going to be From Colorblind to Race-Conscious Parenting. And th this, I think, will fit in very well with our Idlewild's broader conversation on race, but this will be focusing on as it relates to raising our children. That's all. Jenna, thank you so much. Um, this is obviously a class that shifted from Sunday morning to once a month on Thursday evening. So just another example of how we're, we're shifting during pandemic. Um, Lisa Street, I've got you right in the center of my screen and you're gonna tell us about what Presbyterian Women is up to this fall. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning. I'm Lisa Street, and I'm the current uh, moderator of Idlewild Church's Presbyterian Women. As we prepare to kick off this season, I'm uh, very pleased to share some information about upcoming opportunities that we have for gathering. I encourage all the women of the church to join in these times of fellowship. This year will be different as we navigate COVID-19, still continuing to meet as we have over the summer by Zoom. 
In September, our six circles are multi-generational group and all Idlewild women are invited to join and gather in an all-in-one circle, Tuesday, September 1st in the evening at 6 p.m. Where we're listen to a psalm lesson, have discussion and share fellowship. On October 6th, we'll begin our Horizon Bible study, Into the Light, Finding Hope, Through Prayers of Lament by Lynn Miller. These lessons, accompanied by beautiful illustrations, also by the author, are very timely, and I encourage you to join in this year's Bible study. On Tuesday evening, October 20th, we're very excited to try something new. A live stream fall gathering at 6 p.m., complete with a speaker, music, and celebration. Please watch for more details about these opportunities to come together as the women of Idlewild Church. If you're a current circle or group member, you should be receiving your new yearbook, Looks like last year's, but it has the new date and new information included. And if you would like more information about joining one of our circles or groups, or you need the book for the Bible study this year, please let me know. My contact information may be found on Realm or in the church directory. And I think a fitting way to, to finish my, my little talk about Presbyterian women is to share the purpose of Presbyterian women. Forgiven and freed by God and Jesus Christ, and empowered by the Holy Spirit, we commit ourselves to nurture our faith through prayer and Bible study, to support the mission of the church worldwide, to work for justice and peace, and to build an inclusive, caring community of women that strengthens the Presbyterian Church USA and witnesses to the promises of God's kingdom. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, last but not least, we have Ann Bradley Thomas here to talk to us about praying the Psalms. The contemplative group started praying the Psalms on Sunday mornings in the Harlan Room last January, and it got changed to a podcast during the pandemic. The podcast is about 22 minutes in length. 60% of the time is spent in centering reflection silence. The scripture is the focus and is read multiple times. I'm not an expert on the Psalms and don't see myself leading as much as facilitating from personal experience. Laurel Dolan and Alan Sefton have been my co-leaders and I'm so thankful for their support and friendship and knowledge. Um, another way for interacting with the Psalms this fall is 1750 Arts on September 12th is going to do a painting the Psalms class. Um, and in thinking about like why I'm doing um, the podcast and why praying the Psalms is important to me. I kind of, I came up with the top 10 reasons and here they are. Number one is silence. I find that there's something intrinsic about the Psalms that invite me to silence. They're not written for my thinking brain as much as my heart brain. Number two, listening. The pattern of the Psalms is not done in a to-do list. Um, so many of the Psalms are written by a very human king who turned to God rather than his own status. And the Psalms really orbit around God, and they've taught me how to listen to God. Number three, humanity. Jesus was deeply familiar with the Psalms, and they've been prayed from age to age across time, culture, and language. And they connect me to the larger community of the world. Um, community within Idlewild, the Psalms were always part of a community. They were sung, they were memorized, they were not for the literate, and you cannot be, read the Psalms and disconnect them from community. Uh, five, art. The Psalms are poetry, and they're filled with musical words and metaphoric rich words, and they require time to reflect on the meaning, and they draw me to music and art. 
when I think of the songs and art, I see them more as abstract art. Um, and when I think of them as music, I am reminded of Bono, who was a huge um, fan of the Psalms. And Bono says, if you categorize the Psalms, that they would be more blues than gospel. And that the singer doesn't sing the song, the song sings the singer. Um, six, uniqueness. The Psalms are full of breath of emotion from anger and hate, jealousy, joy, thanksgiving. And they remind me to bring all of me to God. They also remind me that each person is unique, unique circumstances, unique personality, unique walk with God. And the Psalms are written for all of us where we are. Number seven, the Psalms are written in a time where society lived closer to nature and found God in the rhythms of the seasons and the beauty of creation. And they saw God that they were praying to as the infinite creator. Number eight, humility. The Psalms show hum humanity just as we are broken and they push me beyond being a self-love person. And I find it's easier to hold hands in community with others from the Psalmist standpoint. Um, number nine, action. The Psalms always leave me with a so what feeling. So what's my response to God? And number 10, praise. No matter what the topic, the Psalms almost always start and end from a praise of prayer. I mean, praise. And God, not the psalmist, is the focus. Um, so to close, I would really welcome all feedback and let me know how to improve the podcast. What are your ideas or ways you think we can build a contemplative community at Attawild um, going forward, but especially during this pandemic time. Thank you, Anne Bradley, and thank you to all of our presenters. Um, this has been really enlightening and it makes me excited for uh, the fall semester. Um, if you have a question for any of our presenters, if you would use uh, our chat feature to ask that question, um, that way we can all see it. And uh, if you have an answer to that question, feel free to unmute yourself, conveners. Thank you, Rick, for putting our, <laughs> our slide up. Any questions? It was a lot of information to absorb all at once. I'm just going through to make sure you could also raise your hand if you want to. Okay. So, um, you know, something that the staff has been talking about really since mid-March, since we found ourselves in the midst of this pandemic is, you know, what is changing um, that's actually, you know, that's actually really good. When, when we kind of come out of this and find some semblance of normal, um, what have we been doing that's actually worth, you know, continuing to do? Um, and when it comes to this this conversation about Christian formation, I find it's you know the, the tricky place <laughs> that we're in is, of course, doing all of this through technology um, is inhospitable um, to many. And uh, I've also heard from folks, um, you know, who have said actually this is a lot more convenient. <laughs> not having to come to a meeting, you know, or a class at the church in the physical building. Um, there's something about this that has actually enabled me to be, um, to participate. So um, we're holding all of that, you know, as we, um, as we go forward um, and figure out kind of what our new normal is. Um, I've had the feeling with this virtual fair, like I'm kind of walking through a department store, um, it's probably our, our human, you know, inclination to 
go towards that thing that you're most interested in. If you had the, the freedom to walk into Montgomery Hall and just go straight towards the faith and function class or praying the Psalms or whatever it was. But the way that we've done it today, um, we've, um, you know, we've heard about everything, which has been, um, I hope that it was a gift for you as it, as it was for me. So I am still looking to see if I have a hand here. I don't want to sign us off too quickly if y'all have questions, but I'm not seeing anything. Bob Llewellyn in the chat has said, just a quick note, the Stephen class, AKA advanced placement Sunday school <laughs> will meet on campus as soon as the church campus is open officially. We will be doing a short series and you can check the adult ministry brochure for a schedule um, in the fall. Thank you, Bob. All right, y'all, just, uh, just because that reminded, Bob's comment reminded me, if you are not subscribed yet to the adult ministry newsletter, um, that comes out every week on Saturday morning, and it'll tell you uh, everything that's happening on Sunday morning and throughout the next week. So if you are not yet subscribed and would like to be, would like to be uh, please send me an email at sdorian at atawild.org. I'll put it in the chat, um, and I will happily subscribe you. Um, to that newsletter so you can be kept up to date. Uh, I think that that is it. Y'all, thank you so much for being here. And I will see you in worship. I can see Ann Apple is heading towards worship. So I'm gonna, thank you, Sarah. I'm gonna meet her in the sanctuary. <laughs> Bye y'all, thank, thank you. you.